So now we can go ahead and look at this um, diagram, that graph, which represents the same thing but in a different kind of way. This is really subtle and you need to understand this, that previously we were looking at, let's say, um, the entrance region and we were talking about the rounding effect, basically. That is what we were looking at, that how if this was a sharp edge and then how the loss coefficient decreases when you go away from these sharp edges and uh, basically make them more well-rounded. So that is what we were looking at previously. Now in this graph, what we are looking at is we're just looking at areas from let's say the first pipe to the second pipe or from a chamber to uh, the pipe, let's say from a reservoir to a pipe you could say. So in this, the subtle difference is that now we're not looking at the rounding effect, but we're actually looking at the area. So when, let's say, we're, we're looking at A2 by A1, so when this area increases over here, this is what we're looking at, how um, thick the diameter is over here, not the rounding effect over here, we're not looking at that. We're just looking to see how, when we increase this diameter, what effect does that have on the loss coefficient. So obviously, if um, area one was equal to area two, then essentially you would have two pipes that have the same diameter, and obviously there wouldn't be any losses. So that's why um, over here, uh, when a2 by a1 is equal to 1, the loss coefficient is 0 over here. And as this starts increasing, as the area ratio starts uh, decreasing, a2 by a1, then the loss coefficient kl starts increasing over here. That is the trend that we are looking at with this curve. That the loss coefficient is increasing as a2 by a1 uh, is decreasing. Okay. So another thing now that we can look at is um, in terms of, let's say, the exit relationship now. Previously we were looking at the inlet conditions and now we're looking at the exit conditions. We were looking at the entrance conditions and now we're looking at the exit flow conditions. And for this what we see is that let's say the loss coefficient for this is equal to one and why is that? Well, because when this fluid is flowing, let's say from a pipe into a tank or from a smaller pipe into a larger pipe, what is happening is that the entire kinetic energy of the fluid that is exiting, that let's say at um, section one, is dissipating into the fluid that is already here, right? So the stream of fluids that is exiting this pipe is mixing in here with the streams that are already here and uh, of the fluid in the tank and then that eventually comes to a position a point where it's at rest now it's not uh, mixing in anymore that is at section two let's say so that means that v2 is going to be zero here right the velocity at section 2 is going to be equal to 0 here so that is the y's velocity at 2 0 because the fluid is coming to a standstill it's coming to rest now so if you apply the energy equation now then the exit loss from point 1 to 2 is going to be equivalent to one velocity head or in terms of the loss coefficient it's going to be equal to 1 so it doesn't matter how much rounder you make this at the exit condition, um, if you start making it, let's say, uh, sharp-edged like this, when we don't have this re-entrant over here, this part is not here, it doesn't matter if it's not here because it's still going to, streams are still going to mix up with the streams that are already present here, and the loss coefficient is going to be 1. It doesn't matter if it's well-rounded, because the same thing is going to happen. So the rounding effect doesn't really 
give you any uh, advantage when it comes to the exit flow conditions for the loss coefficient. But again, if you're looking at the area ratios now, um, then you would see the effect that would have that it would have on the loss coefficient because as the area ratio increases, and uh, if let's say A2 is equal to A1, then it could be a case where um, the diameter is the same, and it will be the case where the diameter is the same. So then the loss coefficient is going to be zero at that point. And as this area ratio starts decreasing, then the loss coefficient starts increasing, uh, right? So this is the second thing that we're looking at. First, we we're looking at the rounding effect, and this time we're looking at the changes in uh, the diameter and consequently subsequently in the areas of the pipes or the pipe in the tank, let's say. So this is the graphical form of uh, the equation for loss coefficient, and that equation is basically something that you can work out through uh, continuity, momentum, and energy equations. I'm not going to go into the details of it because you just have this graph that you usually use and you don't really need to use this relationship for it um, but just for your knowledge this is the equation and this equation that has been plotted here graphically to show you the same thing okay so another thing now that we need to consider is that until now we've just looked at um, simply entrance flow conditions and exit flow conditions but those have been mostly those have been a form that are straighter but the losses would be very different if the contraction or the expansion here let's say this is the expansion right now that you're looking at if the expansion is gradual right so this is when when you're looking at this kind of um, expansion here it's called a diffuser right and, and because the diffuser is a device that is shaped to decelerate the fluid and this angle here of the diffuser this is the most important uh, parameter um, on the basis of which you can determine the loss coefficient so the, for, for very small angles the diffuser the, the diffuser is going to be really long obviously um, and most of the head loss is going to be because of the wall shear stress um, and for larger angles the flow is going to be separating from the wall then if, if it's really sharp then the flow is going to be separating along this wall now um, so then the losses are going to be because of um, the dissipation of the kinetic energy of the jet that is leaving the smaller pipe and I, I should mention here that in fact for larger values of theta here if let's say theta is uh, larger than 35 degrees what we see is that it's not really as efficient anymore because um, it's even less efficient than uh, the sharp edged expansion that we were looking at right so then you have there's no point of using a conically shaped diffuser if you're going to have a theta angle of greater than uh, 35 degrees. There is an optimum uh, theta value that exists and it's usually around 8 degrees uh, for which the loss coefficient is minimum. So KL is going to be minimum um, when theta is going to be approximately 8 degrees. <clears throat> so the relatively small value of theta for minimum uh, loss coefficient means that it's going to result in a longer diffuser, right? Because the theta angle is uh, a lot smaller now. Um, this is just one of the typical ways to look at uh, conditions that would happen for a conical diffuser. It's strongly dependent on 
the area ratio A2 by A1, obviously as indicated here, or A1 by A2. And, uh, but there's other ways that you could look at um, this diffuser. There's other ways or methods to which you can um, basically find out the conditions for the diffuser. I'm not going to go into the details of it right now. Um, and just like the diffuser here, you could look at a nozzle, and the nozzle is the reverse of it because the flow direction is uh, reversed. Um, because then that would be a conical contraction. So nozzles and diffusers are basically words that are used interchangeably usually. usually. So yeah, and then I'm just going to move on now and talk about bends in pipes a little bit because bends in pipes would produce a greater head loss than if the pipe was, let's say, straight. And this loss is taking place because of the separated flow here, right? Because this separated region of flow near the inside of the bend, especially if the bend becomes a lot sharper, then the separation of the flow is going to be even higher. Uh, and this is the first effect, the primary effect, and then the secondary effect that is taking place is uh, because of the swirling that's going to take place, the fluid is going to be swirling in here, and that is going to basically imbalance the centripetal forces because of how the curvature of the pipe is now. So there's two effects that are taking place, and these effects um, are being shown here, basically. This is a 90-degree bend, and uh, for which you would have uh, flow going in, let's say, through here. And uh, it's strongly dependent on this friction factor here, so you have to work that out when you're looking at uh, bends. And uh, what else can I see here? Okay, so you have the curvature that you're looking at, uh, the curvature diameter ratio, and depending on that, you're looking at the loss coefficient over here. So there's some situations where, uh, let's say you've got limited space, and then you use, instead of 90 degree bends, let's say you use something called uh, mitre bends, and in mitre bends, what you're essentially doing is a, mit a mitre bend or an elbow, you can say. It's it's like a joint that is made if you bevel um, two pieces together. So for example, if you have, uh, let's say, you're beveling these together, and usually at a 45 degree angle, let's say, and you're going to be beveling it together, and this is going to give you a corner that forms at a 90 degree angle. So this is a mitre bend, and well, because um, the separation that is taking place over here is so huge, that is why the loss coefficient is going to be a uh, really high as well. So in order to uh, reduce this, to, in order to reduce these considerable losses, what we do is that we use guide wanes. And by using these guide wanes, we can reduce um, this loss coefficient because now the unwanted swirls in here are uh, not being caused anymore because of the guide wanes. The separation is not really taking place. There's less disturbances in the flow. so. Uh, the loss coefficient is a lot um, lower for a mitre bend that would have guide wanes in there too. Um, right, so this is, uh, we've discussed valves, we've discussed mitre bends, uh, we've discussed bends, bends are elbows, bends and elbows are the same thing. Um, and now we can just look at loss coefficient for different pipe components. For example, there could they could be uh, T's, they could be reducers, they could be filters, and for all of them, uh, the value for KL is going to be 
strongly depending on the shape of the component. So for example, when you're looking at the uh, elbows here, this is a 90 degree elbow, this is a 45 degree elbow. And uh, you can see that how the value for KL changes for these different types of elbows. And then you've got return bends to return elbows. That would be uh, basically returning the flow. That, that's a, another important pipe component in here. Um, and then you've got T's. T's are basically uh, connecting different pipe components together. So you've got, this is called line flow, where you've got flow in the same direction. Um, and then you've got the branch flow, where the flow is going to be changing directions. So depending on which kind of flow you're looking at, the uh, loss coefficient is going to be different as well. And loss coefficient can be higher than one as well. So just keep that in mind. And then obviously you have more components. You could have a union in here that is just joining up two different pipe sections. And then you've got different types of valves. I'm not going to go into the types of valves but uh, and, and how they function, but this is a globe valve, and then you've got the uh, swing check valves, uh, the ball valve, the gate valves. There's so many different types of them. And depending on the type that is given to you, you would have to choose a value for the loss coefficient. So this is what minor losses is all about. Um, it's, well, it's specified using loss coefficient KL. That is the main detail that you need to look at. Um, the physics behind it is uh, could be very confusing because you don't really have a theoretical um, basis on which uh, this has been established. It's based on experimental data, uh, really accurate experimental data, but uh, theoretical the, the theoretical um, values behind it or equations behind it, you're not going to find that anywhere. Um, so yeah, this is what my loss is about. I'm just going to leave this review question here for you so you can go through it and uh, just try and uh, play around with different questions that you can find in different textbooks. And this is just a wind tunnel for which you're looking at this section, section 5 to 6. Uh, the velocity here is x. You can assume, let's say, that it's somewhere around 60 meters per second, and you have to estimate the value of the pressure drop between the first and uh, the last section. So just go through the problems, and uh, you'll be good.